Welcome back, everybody. This is the second part of our London lecture series, A Philosopher's Manifesto. Believe it or not, we've just come back from our Christmas break. A bit later than usual, but then these are strange times. But anyway, it's been worth the wait. Today's talk is by Rajiv Bhargav, and he's talking about the importance of uh, multi-religious education. His talk is going to take as a kind of a case study uh, the situation in India. But what he has to say is, I think, of increasing interest, perhaps, in countries like Britain and the US and, and other countries in Europe too, we all found different ways of making our, deciding what kind of religion is or isn't taught in our schools. And perhaps in many countries, we thought those issues had been settled, but in lots of places, these issues are going really very, very live and important again. It's good to go back to first principles and try and work out what exactly the function of religious education should be, whether the state has any role in doing it, and if so, how it should do it. So a very interesting talk ahead. Rajiv's going to talk for about 35 minutes, and then we're going to take questions from you. You can put them into the comment fields, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. We'll get through as many as we can. Can I request, try and make your questions clear and concise, and particularly on YouTube, so they don't spread over more than one box that will really help us. Just to introduce Rajiv, Rajiv Bhargav is currently Honorary Professor and Director at the Parekh Institute of Indian Thought at the Centre for the Study of Developing Studies in Delhi. And he's also an Honorary Fellow at Balliol College in Oxford. His publications are many, they include Individualism in Social Science, The Promise of India's Secular Democracy, and What is Political Theory and Why Do We Need It? And he's currently working on Pluralism, in ancient Indian thought. And he also writes a regular column for a major Indian national daily newspaper, The Hindu. So let's have Rajiv's talk and then we'll have some good discussion afterwards. In this presentation, I address the vexed question of the relationship between secular states and religious education. In theocracies and in states with an established religion, all publicly funded schools are required to impart religious instruction. The issue of whether or not this should be done never arises in such states. But in secular states, this question is important and I believe urgent. My answer to this question is that states already committed to the rule of law that guarantee a bundle of meaningful individual rights, criminalize hate speech, and have an established system of secular education should shed their inhibition about religion and adopt a policy of inter-religious education. This is neither an argument for formal religious instruction in schools, something that states might legitimately discourage, nor given deep religious diversity in all modern societies, the advocacy of teaching the dominant religion. Instead, my claim is, that states must assume responsibility for teaching the ethical traditions of all religions. Religious education should not be left to the family, where learning is largely unsystematic and informal, nor be confined to schools funded and run by religious communities themselves, and where biases might go unchecked. Unbiased inter-religious education alone enables citizens to learn about and responsibly criticize each other's ethical values and traditions. It also helps place one's own ethical tradition in critical perspective. This is necessary for social harmony, a value irreducible to individualistically construed moral values. And I illustrate my argument by discussing the case of India. Now, before exploring this issue any further, I must specify what I mean by religious education. Religious education means a deeper, more thorough understanding of the cumulative tradition of a particular religion. And by cumulative tradition, I mean the historic deposit of the past religious life of the community in question. So temples, scriptures, theological and philosophical systems, dance patterns, legal and social institutions, moral codes, myths, and so on. Literally anything that can be transmitted 
from one person or generation to another, and that even a scholar, that is to say an outsider, can grasp more or less objectively. So while aspects of, a, of particular religious experiences can only be grasped from the inside, traditions are knowable even by outsiders. To repeat, education is the cumulative tradition of a particular religion, uh, and it's different from education about it. Education in religion is part of the larger process of religious instruction, the whole purpose of which is to initiate the child into a faith or to strengthen it if she already has it. Education about the cumulative tradition, as I mentioned uh, already, may be possessed even by the outsider. Hence the phrase religious education is ambiguous between education in religion, which I call religious instruction, and education of the cumulative tradition of a religion. So I, I think this, these two really need to be kept in mind. Uh, for the purposes of my paper. Now, for those who hold the view that all religious education is religious instruction, and in addition, religion is an outdated form of living and knowledge, it's a storehouse of superstition and obscurantism that systematically inculcates blind acceptance of authority and undermines any capacity for independent thought, the answer to the question is obvious. The true function of education is to impart a sense of individual autonomy, that is to say critical thinking, independence of thought, and to make children into good citizens, enable them to learn virtues such as openness, capacity to deliberate and to listen to others, reasonableness, respect for difference, a sense of justice, inclusiveness and accommodation, features believed to be central to a liberal democratic secular vision. Religious education, it is claimed, undermines both. Thus, religious education must not be part of the curriculum of any school, public or private. Rather, there must be one common school which provides only secular education to believers and non-believers alike. Now, how plausible is this view? When a particular religion takes a dogmatic form, systematically undermines individual curiosity and critical thinking and valorizes religious identity above citizenship, then quite clearly it should not be taught in high schools run by secular states. Perhaps such religions should be even actively discouraged by these states. But there is no cumulative religious tradition which wholly fits the above description. So aspects of every known religion can always be be part of the school curriculum. Indeed, it's hard to deny that humans invariably relate to something beyond themselves, that for many this means relating to God, gods and goddesses, or some other higher entity, that they do so in different ways, and that this manifests itself as individual belief and feeling, as well as social practice in the public domain, embodied under modern conditions in different religious and secular spiritual traditions. As a scientist Merlin Donald has argued, humans as we know them always need all three systems of cognition, the mimetic, the mythic and the theoretic. If this is so, religion which emphasizes the mimetic, such as the rituals and gestures and so on, and the mythic, the sort of more imaginative, fictitious uh, narratives, uh, in this case, cosmic narratives, will never entirely disappear. If so, a democratic secularist must find a way of reconciling the importance of citizenship and individual autonomy on the one hand, and religious convictions and commitments on the other. She must understand why, that while they wish to make their children into citizens, parents may, may also wish to give them the opportunity to learn about their ethical traditions, some of which are religious and others which may be non-religious, and also have their identities shaped by them. 
But the democratic secularists can respond by asking, why can't this take place at home? One reason why this may not be adequate is that parents may wish the transmission of this identity-shaping religious deposit to be stable, which is not possible without formal and systematic training, and they may, them, and they may not themselves have the time and qualities required to impart such training to their children. Second, even when they have the time and the inclination to do so, they may additionally require the help of formal teaching and curriculum to supplement instruction at home. Thus, they may wish religious education to take place in schools. And third, the tradition itself may be so rich and complex that it can be taught only by institutions much larger than the family. Now, the liberal democratic secularists might accept this argument, but then, then ask, why can't this be done by separate private schools run by each community? Why get schools funded and run by public money involved in such education? Now, this and other related issues were debated in the Constituent Assembly of India, which, uh, took, which was held between 1946, December 1946 and, and December 1949, uh, and which resulted in the Constitution of India uh, uh, in 1950. In the assembly, the case against religious education in state schools was made on four grounds. First, the financial cost of providing such education is borne by citizens who do not benefit from it. In an egalitarian and democratic society, Public funds raised by taxes must not be utilized for the benefit of any particular religious community. Thus, consider a school established by a local government that gives religious instruction in Hinduism on the ground that a majority of students in this area are Hindus. This violates the given principle because it requires uh, that children of Muslims and other religious communities would nonetheless pay for this instruction. But why should they carry this unfair burden? The cost of religious instruction must be borne by the religious community itself, in this case, the Hindus. As one member of the Consider Assembly put it, all funds for the provision of religious education must be supplied by the community that desires it, not by everyone. Since state schools are publicly funded, religious education must remain a wholly private affair. Now, this argument is sound if state schools teach the cumulative tradition of one dominant religion, but loses force if multi-religious education is imparted in schools. Moreover, this argument is valid only for separate schools that impart only religious education. But multi-religious education, in my view, or in my uh, claim, remains only a fraction of the overall secular curricula. So no religious or secular parent shares any unfair burden for funding the education of his or her child. Surely this takes care of the problem of unfair burden. But several, are, several arguments were put forward in the assembly against the proposal of multi-religious education, several other arguments. First, some liberal minded members claimed that religious education or instruction usually teaches students obedience, but not the art of questioning. A second objection was that such education frequently inculcates insulation from the rest of the political community. The boundaries of religion, religious and politically political communities do not always coincide. Loyalty to one, it was argued, may conflict with loyalty to the other. These limitations obstruct the growth of students into good citizens of a free and democratic society. A state may, may just about tolerate the presence in society of schools that undermine the value of citizenship, but surely it cannot permit this to occur in state-owned educational institutions. Third, a point 
made by the great Dalit leader Ambedkar was that given that many religions claim that their teachings are the only right path for salvation, social peace and harmony are bound to be disturbed when, when doctrinal con con controversies are brought into the public domain. Social peace is possible only if all religions publicly declare that they do not have monopoly over ultimate truths or are publicly silent on this matter. Since religions that believe that they have monopoly over ultimate truth cannot publicly deny it, the most that can be expected from them is that they do not publicly assert this belief, but remain silent instead. This means that the doctrines of such religions must not be brought into the public domain. It follows that instruction in these religions should not be permitted in publicly funded institutions. Given further a commitment to egalitarianism and therefore to state neutrality, no religious community should be given the right to religious instruction in educational institutions funded by the state. A fourth related, related objection came from those who feared that religious instruction exacerbates communalism and uh, communal conflict. One member wanted the article concerning religious education to be framed, keeping in mind not sects and denominations as they might exist in some ideal world, but as they really are. Really existing sects and denominations frequently forget the basic truth of all religions, he argued, and exalt their own particular brand as, they, as any advertiser in the market lords his own wares. Another member argued that religion had been exploited and marketed in the country and has led to the worst horrors that could be perpetrated in the name of religion. Another Parsi member argued that the religious books of the various communities are translated by various authors in a manner that has really brought disgrace to religion. The authors have translated, he said, the beautiful original phrases to suit their own political ends, with the result that today, on religious grounds, the country is broken into various pieces. Therefore, he went on to say, under existing circumstances, there should be no religious education provided in any educational institution which receive state funding. The constitution cannot give people the freedom to teach religion in any manner they like. Finally, there was a fifth argument that was propelled by an anti-majoritarian impulse. For example, most Sikh members supported a total ban on religious education in educational institutions maintained wholly out of state funds because they feared that this would in, invariably favor the religion of the majority community. Now, I concede straight away that in contexts where religious passions are inflamed recurrently, hate speech against one another is common, the system of rule of law has virtually collapsed and conservative communitarianism has trumped individual rights. In short, where liberal democracy has ceased to function, secular states should refrain from religious education in schools they fund. And indeed, we know that there are many secular states which are not liberal democratic in the way in which I've just outlined. Indeed, there should be stringent laws against negative stereotyping, hate speech and incitement to violence in such states. This is why my suggestion that secular states should shed their inhibition about religious education is limited to functioning liberal democracies. The argument that religion teaches obedience rather than critical questioning takes a narrow one-sided view of religion. For a start, debates and arguments were a part and parcel of ancient Hindu and Buddhist cultures, as indeed they were even in quote-unquote medieval Islamic cultures shaped by the Indian ethos. Second, theological debates were common in Islam, in Islam and Christianity too. But even if the doctrinaire versions of religions were also given space in the curricula, they would, be, they would only be taught in schools that give a strong emphasis on critical scrutiny and questioning. What pupils must learn in religiously diverse society 
is critical respect for all religions. They must learn to respect genuine difference in ethical viewpoints. And as the ancient Indian emperor Ashoka put it, learn to criticize each other when they have good reason to, only on appropriate occasions and always moderately, in a manner that does not humiliate others. Equally, he went on to say, they must learn to be self-critical and not glorify their own religion. No praise, he argued, is justified when there are no good reasons to do so, when they're articulated on inappropriate occasions and when they're done immoderately. One must learn not to brag about one's religion. When interaction takes place in the right way, there is a good chance that people would shed dogma and become less doctrinaire. How else have religiously diverse societies existed for so long? The motto of schools that impart multi-religious education should be critical respect, not excessive uncritical indulgence for one's own and disdain for other religions. Surely this takes care of Ambedkar's worry about religious conflict. Uh, second, communalism ex ex exacerbated because people misunderstand each other's religion. Though some religious conflicts could arise if people began to better understand each other's religion, most are intensified instead by false propaganda, stereotyping and caricature. Perhaps teaching of different religions assists in dispelling these and also, diffu and also diffuses tension between religious groups. It should do so as much by minimizing prejudice as by helping us see the fidelity of trite answers, answers such as all religions are essentially the same. Third, Schools that inculcate critical reasoning and virtues of citizenship equip their pupils, pupils to think contextually and sensitively about all ethical conflicts. This would help them resolve problems of potential divided loyalties too. They should be able to negotiate if they have learned critical reasoning and the capacity to negotiate and accommodate one another. And finally, the argument that majoritarianism may be fueled by funding religious education is invalidated if schools run or funded by the state give equal weight to the teaching of all religions, regardless of their numbers or social dominance. On the contrary, imagine a school run by the majority community, but that admits students from the minority community. Here, the ethos of the school is likely to be permeated by the culture or religion of the majority resulting in the estrangement of minorities who may have strong feelings of being misfits. To avoid having this feeling of alienation, they, e they may even be compulsively wish to assimilate. On the other hand, in publicly funded schools with multi-religious education, maintaining community identity will be easier, if not always without problems. If so, state funding is likely to benefit the minority community. That is to say, for schools uh, where there is multi-religious uh, education. Fourth, multi or inter-religious education is crucial because just and peaceful societies cannot be built either without persons of faith or when people of different faiths clash with one another. Nor can they be built any longer by foolishly persevering with the belief that all religions other than one's own are wrong by the desire to dominate people of other faiths. They can be built only when diverse groups of believers and non-believers can come to effective mutual understanding, accommodation and acceptance. So what is needed today is not just that Muslims, Hindus, Christians or atheists be good Muslims, Hindus, Christians and atheists only in their own respective religious communities, but rather that, that, be, that they be good Muslims, Hindus, Christians or atheists in a world where other intelligent and sensitive people are not Hindus or Muslims, Christians or atheists. 
This is only possible with sensible multi-religious education. It re also requires a proper setting where children from different religious backgrounds have the opportunity to meet one another, as they normally do in common state-run schools, and learn that ways of thinking and being exist in forms other than the one taught by their parents. They may even learn to respect other ways of life and thought. This is crucial for civic friendship, for realizing the values of citizenship. We need schools to encourage students to listen to one another, to learn from and accept each other. We need multi-religious education to, in order to become good citizens. For all, after all, really existing individuals are not abstract citizens, but members of various subcultures and communities. We do not interact with, with them only in religion-free public domains, but also in domains, public and political, which are mediated by religions. To learn how to negotiate these is a skill that must be learned, not just at home, but in schools, or rather it can't be learned at home, but only be learned in schools. Nor can schools run privately by religious communities carry the burden of teaching how to be good citizens. Uh, sensitive to the religious sensibility of others. The prime function of community-run private schools is education in one religion or religious instruction. In short, only schools with a predominantly secular or common curricula that neither discriminates on grounds of religion in their policy of admission, nor compels children to be instructed in any one religion, which teach the strengths and weaknesses of every religion but refuse to foster negative stereotypes of others. In short, state funding public schools alone can perform this task. A final argument for religious education in India, and now that uh, there are Hindus uh, in other parts of the world as well, and therefore to some extent in all societies with sufficient number of Hindus, uh, is grounded in a peculiar feature of religious perspectives, such as Hinduism. The very distinction between religion, philosophy and culture makes no sense in Hinduism. Therefore, taking religion out of public education would mean virtually excluding Indian culture in civilization from any uh, curriculum. In this context, Ambedkar, the great Dalit leader who I've already mentioned, made an interesting distinction between religious instruction and religious education, a, a distinction that I've used myself, and argued in favor of religious education. When asked if institutions where the Vedas, the Smritis, the Gita, the Upanishads are taught and which are maintained wholly out of state funds, whether they will be shut down once the constitution comes into force, Dr. Ambedkar replied that there is a distinction between religious instruction and religious study. Religious instruction means the teaching of dogma. Religious study or religious education is different. Religious study must imply that we also question dogma because all education implies possible critique. That is critical question of anything under scrutiny. The implication was clear. The critical study of religious texts is not only permissible, but must be positively encouraged. My argument has been that we must wriggle out of the dichotomy of state schools without religious education on the one hand and separate community run private schools on the other hand that provide religious instruction. Even if these schools teach their own religion in the right way, for example, without deriding other religions, they would not teach other religions. If so, we would be in a situation where no school imparts proper inter-religious education or education about religions other than their own. And that I think is necessary for inter-religious understanding and eventually for civic friendship. If we were to leave inter-religious education out, I think that would be extremely unhealthy for liberal democratic secular societies that are also looking for social harmony. Now, it might finally be objected that some, by some that states that teach religions 
are violating a basic principle of secularism, namely that state and religion should not mix, that they should maintain something akin to a wall of separation between one another. But this confuses a specific strategy of a particular phase in a single country's self-understanding with a general principle. This strict separation is not crucial for political secularism. Secularism is a critical perspective against all forms of inter and intra-religious domination. It expects the state to be a guardian of religious related values of freedom, equality, and fraternity. To do so, the state may engage with religion or disengage from it. It may engage with it positively, for example, provide multi-religious education, or negatively, but that is, for example, intervening in those religious practices that are demeaning and oppressive towards its own vulnerable members and which its leaders continue to neglect. In short, what secularism requires is that the state keep what I call principal distance from all religions, not that there be a strict separation between the two. Providing, religious, providing multi-religious education for the sake of reducing the alienation of some citizens and for enhancing social and political harmony or fraternity is perfectly in keeping with the core principles of secularism. I've argued that under some circumstances, a secular state may directly provide multi-religious education as an integral part of the larger project of secular education by the state. This is necessary because only such schools can teach young boys and girls a language to engage each other respectfully, respectfully under different religious traditions, as well as be critical of one another in the right way. In societies with a vibrant religious past or with citizens with a lively involvement in their respective religions, religious education is crucial for strengthening mutual respect and in turn for enhancing fraternity. Only then will they less likely to be prejudiced, prejudiced against the religions of others and be more critical of their own religion that is to say, be more self-critical. I end this presentation with a hope. The hope that one day we will discard the idea of religion presupposed by the idea of multi-religious education that I've endorsed in this paper. In the present form, multi-religious education means learning about a religion that is one's own and then secondarily learning about religions that are not one soon, which belong to others. However, this idea of separate religious systems to which each of us owe distinct allegiance is not a natural idea. As Wilfred Cantwell Smith, the great historian of comparative religions, so brilliantly showed in his own book. Asian faiths in particular are not and can, can, can become religions only, religion in this other sense, only with cataclysmic distortion. Now, it is well known that until the, until the last, uh, until 19th century in the recent past, and in many parts of rural India, and perhaps even today, a person could easily be both a Hindu and a Muslim. Even today, a single Chinese may be, may be and usually is a Confucian, a Buddhist and a Taoist. This may baffle many for it is difficult for us to imagine how a single person can belong to three different religions. But as Wintwell Smith, uh, Cantwell Smith reminds us, this perplexity arises from an inappropriate imposition of the concept of religion or a religious system on what really are three rich and complex traditions of thought. These schools of thought have been cherished for centuries in India, sorry, in China. And also these traditions of thought, these schools of thought exist in India. Their teachings are available and everyone partakes of them 
But what each person does with them is entirely up to him or her. Take the case of political thought and theory. This is by analogy. As a student of political thought, I cherish the thought of Plato, Aristotle, Locke, Burke, Rousseau, Marx, Gandhi, and Ambedkar. But I do not necessarily become an ideologically committed Lockean or Burkean or Gandhian as I do when I embrace a religion or I embrace an atheistic ideology. I embrace only a part of their thought without swallowing the whole, and I remain critical of some of their thinking. Nor do I feel the need to build a close community around each tradition of thinking. It is my hope that it would be possible one day for each one of us to partake of the rich traditions of the Jains, the Buddhist, the several communities that fall under the umbrella of, of Hindus, the Muslims, the Jews, the Christian, as well as of the many indigenous peoples without the compulsive need to publicly display that we belong first and foremost to only one of these. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Rajiv. It's very interesting. I mean, I, I must confess to being largely persuaded, but I'm going to raise many questions myself and hopefully some audience will too. If you've got any questions, please do put them into the comments or below on the YouTube or the Facebook feed, wherever you're watching from. Um, to start off with, Rajiv, I want to ask you a question which um, help, might open up some other questions, actually. On the, on the one hand, your argument concerns the uh, role of state funding. So it's particularly about the role of the state and how far they should be involved in these things. Um, but a lot of the what you talk about is what's kind of necessary for a pluralistic, diverse society. And I suppose I want a little bit of clarification about what this means for um, schools which are not run by the state. Um, in the UK, we've got quite a lot of these actually, uh, faith schools they're called, um, schools which are largely or partially funded by religious organisations, have a particular faith ethos in them. Um, does your argument really entail that we cannot tolerate, we cannot have schools which actually instruct in a particular religion? Or, or is it kind of somehow okay as long as they're not state funded? Because I think if, if the latter, it seems like uh, all the good reasons you have for why we need this kind of education in a diverse society, uh, are, those are those worries aren't being addressed. If it if it's if it's the form, on the other hand, and they're allowed, then, well, we we're going to we're going to have a, a a problem here in the sense that the kind of state the kind of education which you think is good is only going to be taught in in those state schools, and other people are going to uh, be teaching things elsewhere. So, where in your system was is there legitimacy to schools not funded by the state that really do instruct in a particular religion? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I needed to be uh, clearer on this. No, I have absolutely no objection to uh, religious instruction being given either at home or in schools run by religious communities themselves and funded entirely by them. That's perfectly okay. Uh, what I don't expect these uh, uh, schools which are privately funded, that is to say funded by religious communities themselves to be able to impart a proper multi-religious education, uh, which requires a, a different kind of cooperation between religious communities and uh, uh, those state officials who are entirely neutral in, in so far as neutrality is possible or entirely impartial to all religious communities. So, uh, the curriculum has to be decided in a very different way in which it would be decided, say, in a school run by Protestants or by Catholics or Jews and so on. So what I'm what what I what I what I think is that the state should take on the responsibility uh, more seriously than it has so far to undertake uh, 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 the the. To, to the teaching and uh, uh, to enable uh, pupils to be educated in what I call 
following Wilfred Cantrell Smith, uh, the cumulative tradition of every religion. I think that is something uh, which cannot be ignored. It has shaped, uh, you know, our uh, our identities, and in fact, uh, our identities, uh, that is to say, identities of all of us are far more layered than we recognize. Uh, I think even if uh, you look at the history of Europe, I think the contribution of Islam, for example, or or uh, even the contribution of Buddhism and, and Hinduism, uh, has to be uh, you know properly researched and 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 uh, uh, taken into account and uh, uh, it should become part of the uh, curriculum i think we have divided uh, uh, each other uh, uh, in in terms of cultures civilizations and religions far too much and i think there is a much greater uh, need to understand that from very early on there have been uh, historical uh, interconnections. There have been, you can say that there is some kind of a global history which is waiting to be written uh, in which uh, uh, inter-religious encounters have also taken a very major part in shaping and influencing uh, every uh, religion that we are now recognize to be very different from every other religion. So uh, what I mean is that uh, this, uh, this uh, study of the dynamic uh, uh, interconnected uh, history of uh, different religions and and uh, how these traditions uh, have developed and how they have uh, to be how they have been imparted uh, and how they have changed and modified and I don't just mean uh, you know all the all the the good things about these traditions I mean traditions. Uh, uh, develop positively, but also they regress sometimes. Uh, I mean, by all kinds of acts of uh, of neglect, uh, acts of commission, commission. I think all this complicated history needs to be taught because it's a very important component of the uh, uh, of the of the making of the identity of uh, virtually every human being. And uh, I don't think that uh, schools which are run by uh, by uh, uh, separate religious communities whose main uh, interest uh, is in uh, in instructing uh, pupils in a, in a, and initiating pupils in a particular faith. I mean, I don't think they can perform this job and I don't think we can leave it to homes, uh, to families at homes either. So that's, that's basically uh, my argument. Sure, but that, doesn't that mean then that if you have a large number of these religious schools, it means a significant number of the population are going to be educated in the wrong kind of way about religion, if you like. They're not going to get this uh, kind of religious education that you want. So, I mean, so this is why I think the, 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 the dilemma is, I mean, one thing you could do is you could insist that these schools teach this as well as best they can, but you've already explained they're not probably not going to do it um, very well. So given how important this education is, isn't it a bit of a problem to say that, yes, it's important yeah. and we can also allow, we, we're going to allow religious schools. And in other words, let's put it the other way around. What's the argument for allowing such schools to exist? Why should we allow any schools to exist which are going to instruct pupils and not give them this very important education? What, what right do they have to, to function? Well, I think uh, it is basically in the, it, there are two interests at work here, and uh, these interests have to, have to be reconciled with the uh, demands of, uh, of uh, uh, good citizenship, uh, a fraternity between citizens on the one hand, for which I think multi-religious education is important, but also uh, in the interest of a deeper understanding of ourselves. Uh, as human beings, which may be a more complicated argument for a very rich and complicated and historically developed humanism, right? So uh, I think what I'm, I mean, I, I may not have fully worked it out, but what I think is that, so, so the, the two values at play uh, when we uh, allow uh, schools to be run by religious communities is A, uh, I mean, a religious liberty, uh, that's important. It's part of any, uh, you know, part of uh, uh, individual freedom. Uh, 
as well as uh, 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 the freedom of uh, different uh, religious communities to set up schools with their own money. I mean, that is something uh, may, it may, it, it's, it's good, not necessarily for giving, uh, 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 I mean, uh, maybe it's not the, the best uh, sort of education uh, that, that can be provided from the point, to, from the other point of view, from the point of view of, of, of a rich, uh, a non-abstract citizenship uh, and, and, and for a deeper understanding of humanity, it may not be, but I think uh, in the demands of liberty require that we give it. But also, uh, as I said, uh, parents may feel, uh, they may want their children to uh, be, be, become, uh, you know, uh, 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 people with strong religious convictions and, and I mean, they take, may take their religious identities far more seriously than, than they uh, uh, take other things. And, and we cannot restrict their liberty uh, to, uh, to uh, in, in, the, in the name of anything, any other value. So, so I think uh, I wouldn't uh, curtail this liberty, but I would hope that in the long run, uh, there would be, along with religious instruction in schools, which are run by communities themselves, uh, along with religious instruction, there would be some kind of an uh, 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 understanding uh, that multi-religious education is also important. And uh, in future, or perhaps even now, I'm sure some schools do it. I mean, uh, those schools which are sensitive, uh, uh, to to uh, to religious plurality, even if they are run by you know one single religious community, I think they they uh, probably already have uh, a multi-religious education uh, in their school. So I hope that in future, and you know, uh, they would be able to they 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 would uh, uh, learn. They would have the uh, they would draw the right lessons of uh, the linkages between. Uh, good uh, citizenship and multi-religious education, and they would be able to instruct. Uh, you know, they may have preference uh, in 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 one uh, for one religion, but they would also uh, slowly understand the importance of other religious traditions. Uh, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, just, just to, I don't want to push this point too much, but I think it's important to get quite quite clear about it. Are, are you kind of suggesting there's a kind of there's a pluralism of values here, which means that we, we basically can't have it, it both ways. We, we have to make a compromise. So on the one hand, you have to allow people the liberty to pursue their own uh, religions, their own views, etc., even when those views of themselves actually are somewhat in conflict with the shared secular values we might want. On the other hand, we obviously want people to have, as many people as possible, to have this kind of fully rounded religious in case, education rather than instruction. And in a sense, there's no way of, of whatever we do in practice is going to entail some kind of a compromise because either we'd have to restrict people's religious liberty more than is acceptable for a liberal state, right, by banning religious schools, or, or that, 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 that's, that's not the sort of, or we have to just ex allow the fact that a lot of people are going to be educated in a way which is far from optimal for the flourishing of our harmonious understanding society. Uh, we have to have a trade off. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, I think some balancing is, uh, is the word that I would use. I mean, uh, look, Schools, let's uh, learn that uh, schools are are only one source of the transmission of values. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of other ways and people can learn how to be good citizens. I mean, so it's entirely possible that uh, uh, people who go to schools which are run by religious communities have other ways of learning uh, 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 the, 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 the virtues of a, of a good citizen. Uh, I think, I, in my view, it would be inadequate because uh, 
if teaching about uh, other people's cultures and their their historical traditions, which would include their religious traditions, is crucial to uh, 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 to uh, mutual understanding, which may be a, a, a necessary condition for uh, for accommodation and and for uh, for uh, for for uh, some degree of uh, of harmony. Then I think uh, uh, some of these uh, students will invariably be falling short of the demands that I would like to place on them uh, in my sort of understanding of what it is to be a good citizen. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there is, you can use uh, this word trade-off. There is, there is a trade-off involved here. I mean, you, you can't really have uh, two uh, important values uh, be made available uh, at the same time to everyone uh, in at their at their you know in their best form, uh, but but I think it's it's better to somehow uh, balance them or have some kind of a trade off than to negate one or the other completely. So yeah, I'm 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 kind of a a pluralist, a Ber Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a pluralist in some ways. I mean, I think there is invariably some kind of a conflict of values here, which we cannot fully resolve, but which we can uh, resolve uh, uh, enough uh, and sufficiently to be able to uh, live, uh, you know, reasonably well. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, just a reminder, you can put questions in the uh, boxes below and I will get to them if they come in. I've got plenty on my own. Don't don't worry that we're going to run out of conversation if you don't give them, but I'd like to certainly invite you to, to take part if you'd like. Um, so let's just uh, push a bit further. I know this perhaps goes slightly beyond the scope of, of, of what you said in the talk, but it's an interesting thing to, to sort of follow through the consequences of, of what you're arguing for. Um, one of the things that has worried people in the UK, um, I'm talking about the UK context because I know it better than some others, but um, one of these concerns is that some of these religious schools, it seems, you know, are teaching things which people do believe to be um, damaging, um, to, perhaps to society as a whole, perhaps to the children. So, for instance, uh, there might be... Uh, in teaching of creationism in certain religious schools, which I think people is saying is basically teaching children false information, false facts, although, you know, from the point of view of the religion, that is a, a creed. Um, sometimes there's a concern that some of the exclusivism being taught there uh, leads people to perhaps, you know, uh, think badly of their fellow citizens. Children are being brought up to believe, for instance, that atheists are perhaps wicked or degenerate, whatever it might be. Um, so given that you do allow, there has to be this freedom to instruct your children to bring them up. Should the state place any limits on that at all? Uh, what, what would be the, when, if any, would be the times where the state would be justified as to sort of like actually going in and saying, you can't teach this? <laughs> Yeah. So I think, uh, as I said, my argument is uh, is uh, is for going beyond liberal democracy, but not to go against it. So uh, I assume that uh, some of the basic structure of a liberal democratic system is, uh, uh, you know, that that structure is already in place. Uh, I've said in the paper that uh, I wouldn't allow negative stereotyping. Uh, I would have a proper uh, uh, law uh, criminalizing hate speech. Uh, I mean, uh, so, so uh, or a law which uh, uh, undermines, uh, you know, uh, basic individual liberties uh, in uh, 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 supporting, on the other hand, some conservative orthodoxy which demands uh, 
the subsumption of individual uh, uh, within a, a, a holistic sort of community. So I, I think those are uh, laws that I assume are already in place. Uh, uh, so I think that I, is, is, is really taken care of. On the other hand, when we come to something like creationism, uh, right? It's not, uh, it's, it's just teaching something which uh, some people rightly, in my view, strongly believe is, is, is false. Uh, uh, I think I would uh, definitely uh, like uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, I, I assume that in, there is some national curriculum which is also in place in these schools uh, where, uh, you know, you have uh, the, uh, uh, the inculcation of uh, very simple sort of, but Im important tools of, of, of critical scrutiny, independence of thought and so on. Uh, so I would imagine that uh, if these schools are also, also teaching uh, critical reasoning, then at some point of time, people would be able to uh, question uh, the claims of, uh, of uh, you know, those who advocate creationism or any other uh, belief which is held by, by uh, as, as uh, pretty nonsensical by, by, by scientists. Uh, so, I mean, I would, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would say that uh, I would sort of leave it to, uh, uh, I mean, that is a problem. You see, that's, that's, so you, 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 you got me, uh, uh, I mean, you put me rightly on the spot when you said that, you know, I can't have it both ways. Uh, but as I said, I mean, there is, uh, we, we have two options here, isn't it? We can either regulate the national curriculum in such a way that we outlaw the teaching of creationism. Um, and I don't know what happens in England. Is this possible in England? Uh, I mean, to teach uh, in schools or are you talking only of the, the American context? Uh, yeah, no, it's a good question, actually. I, I don't know whether it's literally illegal. There is a national curriculum requirement, I think, even for independent schools. So, yes. but, you know, there are certain gray areas around this. And uh, <laughs> I think that what sometimes happens is, is that, you know, for example, it, it may not be in the science class that, that, that this is taught. But I mean, just to, to, to follow through on this, I mean, it, it does seem that, uh, you know, this, this is a classic, this is a classic liberal dilemma, isn't it? How much do you really tolerate? And so uh, the, the liberal uh, ideal is that one tolerates difference and one tolerates different views. But when it comes up against it, it seems that time and again, the liberal isn't actually prepared to tolerate any view which undermines their own core liberal views. And therefore, the, the accusation of, of hypocrisy there. So, for example, I mean, you talked about some of the things that you would you would ban. I think there was some interesting case in the UK recently. Well, I think there was some I think it was some sex education literature, again, going around in a, in a Christian faith school. And I think it's really worth pointing this out, by the way, because People often, the headlines are often more captured by things that might go on in Islamic schools or in particular, but a, a, lot of the, a lot of the controversies have actually come out of Christian schools. And I think in this piece of sex education, it was really teaching, it was teaching girls that, you know, that they essentially have to be subservient to the men in, 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 in sexual relations, which, you know, a lot, most people would say is, is, is appalling, goes against values. But if we truly were allowing for, for people to have substantive worldviews, which don't agree with us, then you know, and and we're not, but we're not prepared for them to say things like that. Isn't there the idea, the problem there, that you know, liberal tolerance is, well, if not hypocritical, it's it's not really what it seems. It's it's rather, we should we just be more honest and say liberal tolerance actually is is quite constrained. Uh, I think you, I mean, uh, undoubtedly there are always. Uh, you know, there is, there, there, there is, uh, there are some constraints that are invariably present in any uh, system. I mean, the the idea that liberalism doesn't presuppose a good is uh, simply 
uh, implausible. Uh, there is a certain conception of the good, which is presupposed by liberalism. And that uh, commitment to that good uh, uh, rules out certain things. And I think, as you put it, 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 would, be, it would be right to acknowledge that uh, and not, uh, not uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 duck the issue. Uh, on the other hand, my, you know, on, on, there, are, there are many issues where I think we could be uh, more accommodative. I mean, I think that if, if a particular uh, way or a, a particular sort of perspective or doctrine uh, is largely untrue uh, by standards, by, 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 by methods which are accepted uh, by uh, which which are sort of uh, which pass uh, the uh, critical scrutiny, uh, critical public scrutiny of science. Uh, you know, if they it turns out that they are false, then I would simply say that uh, to some extent uh, it it should in private schools they should be allowed. I mean, tolerated as long as uh, you know, children are also taught, uh, uh, you know, ways, and this is something that I've already mentioned, uh, ways by which you can, you know, challenge them at some other point of time. In other words, if you, if you are becoming, uh, 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 if your your you, if your faculty of critical reasoning are also being developed in other ways, then I think uh, they would be able to see the 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 uh, absurdity of some of the claims that are made by by various uh, doctrines that are that are taught as part of religious instruction in schools so i would say uh, some kind of balance has to be uh, kind of uh, 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 reached there uh, mm. but 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 there is another issue i mean i think in india for example uh, if these schools are run entirely by religious communities, funded entirely by them, then, you know, the constraints uh, are less. I'm now talking purely in terms of constitutional law, uh, not in practice. Uh, there are very few constraints on them. But if, on the other hand, you take even one rupee from the state, then the state has the power to regulate uh, a lot of these uh, the school curriculum and and so the national curriculum then comes into the picture and uh, and i imagine that a lot of schools which are run by by uh, different faith communities in britain are also funded by the state uh, i mean they are not run by the state mm -hmm. and they are not wholly funded by the state but they are funded by the state as well and as long as there is mixed funding, private and public, then uh, I think the state then gets a legitimate reason to have some kind of regulation of the national curriculum. And, and that's the way in which uh, you can uh, shape, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the overall education uh, system of, of these uh, schools which are run by religious communities. On the other hand, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, the, 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 I don't want to underestimate the, the danger from the other side. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, a lot of the uh, uh, officials of the state, uh, they themselves may have, uh, I mean, the, the, the so-called implementers, I mean, they themselves uh, may either be, uh, you know, they may have their own uh, very strong anti-religious bias, or they may have... A, you know, religious, uh, you know, preference for one religion rather than another, and they may bring into play certain pre uh, certain prejudices, uh, which may lead uh, to, you know, various uh, problems, and those problems need to be sorted out in some other public fora. So, uh, having, you know, one can't trust uh, the state to to uh, to undertake. Uh, uh, or to determine entirely, you know, what exactly the, uh, the, 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 the basic contours of religious education would be like in schools which are actually funded entirely by religious communities themselves. 
Uh, for me, I think uh, just as uh, this is a larger point, I mean, parents have, after all, uh, the right not to send their children to schools. In many societies, uh, they don't. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they may not. They may, may want their children to to be educated. I mean, they would be, be foolish to do that. I mean, but but I think in so far as they're, they're right, it's, I mean, there is no compulsory uh, education for children uh, uh, in many uh, societies. And parents have the right to uh, to have teaching done entirely at home, uh, just as they have a right to send their children to a faith community, which is extremely limited in its understanding of, you know, the larger common good and so on. Uh, it may be very sectarian. And I think uh, uh, this is something that uh, we we simply have to, you know, find ways of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, confronting, uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, having uh, repressive laws is a good way to address these issues. There have to be other ways in which we have to, you know, come around this problem. Uh, and and in that sense, you know, this kind of li liberalism is something that I would be, I would be in favor of a liberalism that tolerates certain things, rather than a liberalism that has a very strong idea of what, you know, what, what, I mean, what what the idea of the good is, uh, which is. Uh, you know, perfectionist form of in, individual uh, autonomy uh, and so on. I think, uh, I mean, we, we know that there are debates within liberalism on this, on, on what is an appropriate understanding of, the best understanding of what a liberal, uh, what the liberal philosophy is and what liberalism is. And there is no, you know, single answer, but, but of the, if let's say, if there are two liberalisms here, uh, at uh, 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 on under discussion, a uh, liberalism which advocates a very strong idea of the good, and a liberalism that has uh, a pluralist conception of the good, uh, uh, I would and which then encourages more toleration. And I would sort of favor the 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 second. More because they, there is another uh, very important uh, value which is at the heart of liberalism, which is uh, 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 some suspicion of, of, of the state and to understand the limits of, of what the state can do, uh, what kind of impartiality you can really expect from the state. And to, to put everything, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to assume that uh, anything that we uh, put on the state uh, make make the state responsible for it will be able to execute it perfectly. I think that is an unrealistic assumption. And we've got a couple of got a couple of audience questions. We're going to come to in a second, but I think I've, I've got one which kind of leads us um, in the direction of where they're coming from. Um, and this is a question really. An objection is often made to the kind of religious education you get in secular societies that it almost by implication presents religion in a, in a certain way which is problematic namely it sort of presents religion as inherently kind of relativistic it's sort of like you know you've got your judaism you've got your hinduism you've got your islam they, these and you know it may there's a kind of implied relativism here i mean the 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 teaching sort of like uh, it, maybe even explicitly kind of says you know none of these things has 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 truth um, you can take your pick, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and that's kind of potentially distorting because that's not how these religions often seem from the inside. They're very diverse, of course, so one can't say this entirely. But so, do you think there's this sort of problem that the kind of secular religious education presents a somewhat diluted, relativistic version of religion, and therefore is actually fundamentally misrepresenting it? Yeah, I think that is a that is indeed a problem. I mean, it's like uh, this kind of uh, you know uh, 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 the, uh, it's a commodific a certain commodification of religion, the the marketplace of religious ideas, where you can simply pick and choose and uh, and discard anything you wish, as in when uh, you please, or or keep it for as long as you want. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, there is a certain, uh, this is something which is in fashion 
uh, in contemporary uh, spiritual uh, kind of uh, spheres. Uh, and I think uh, that is um, that is mistaken, fundamentally mistaken, because the very idea of ethics in the deeper sense, and certainly the best in religious ethics, as well as in non-religious ethics, is to dig deeper and to go higher, uh, uh, and that is a that's not something that is easily done. It is something which has to be learned and which has to be learned patiently. And uh, it's 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 a, it's a, it's an exercise uh, uh, which is to be which is long drawn and 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 it takes time and effort and a lot of labor. So and and if it is really to make a difference to who you are and and what what sort of self you constitute, uh, and I think that is fundamental to 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 uh, to religious religious uh, experience in a uh, or to you know broader spiritual experience of a certain kind of a fundamental transformation of the self by which you be become both deeper and in some ways you know uh, rise above. Uh, uh, you know, move higher, and I think uh, the kind of relativistic uh, 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 picture that you've drawn of different religions doesn't quite doesn't quite uh, match uh, what I'm saying, and therefore I'm I'm not very happy if if secularism, uh, kind of of secular states or secularists or secularism, uh, distorts religion uh, in in the manner in which you just. Uh, uh, portrayed. I think that would be a mistake. I mean, so I think uh, religious education really has to be uh, a deep, as I said, a deeper and more thorough understanding of uh, of the, and I'm using uh, this term cumulative tradition uh, uh, taken from uh, that the great sort of scholar of comparative religion, Wilfred Canton Smith, I mean, uh, I think uh, that's that cumulative tradition, that historic deposit, is something which is transmitted from one generation to another, and as it gets transmitted to people who genuinely kind of are followers of that religion, they they, I mean, they 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 uh, give something to it as much as they take from it, and and it sort of moves further uh, 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 down. I think uh, this. This is a very, uh, this is a, this is a serious and and deep idea, and uh, I think some sense of that has to be given by religious education. Uh, so yeah, I would uh, I would certainly not uh, be very happy with any uh, secular uh, education that civilizes uh, uh, religious experiences. Uh, well, thanks. So we got, and distorts it. We, we, yeah. Yeah. Got a question actually from Shiva Bermeza. Um, this is, mm. I think, this is a suggestion for how maybe we can have a form of religious education which uh, perhaps avoids some of those pitfalls of someone getting engaged in stories and getting indoctrinated from, from an outside. Could we just not restrict the teaching of education or focus on the history of these religious and the interreligious encounters and really try and set aside the teachings of the holy books because that gets us into hot water is is that a proposal you think is feasible or desirable i think both or not i think it's feasible i think i'm i'm in favor of what uh, uh, mr babazai is saying uh, i think uh, i think the teachings of holy books and their doctrines are really uh, you know fall under what i call and what many other people have called religious instruction that is teaching in religion, and that is something which I would sort of leave to private schools, uh, uh, which are run by religious communities. But publicly funded schools will really have to focus much more on this other thing that he mentioned, which is, uh, you know, uh, is encounters uh, between religions and and uh, and between uh, these traditions. So more, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it is, I mean, it's a very deeply 
uh, informed understanding of each other's uh, uh, of e e e each other's uh, uh, ways of uh, thinking and and living, um, and and uh, more a teaching of holy books and doctrines. I mean, so yeah, I I quite a, I agree with that. Okay, I would agree with good. That. Yeah, that's, that's that. yeah. good. Um, I've got another question to come to in a minute. Before we do, I, I didn't want to, because we're getting towards the end now, I didn't want to finish up without asking a little bit more about this idea of what critical respect means. Because I think that, you know, when we think of, a lot of people object that when people talk about being respectful of religions, that actually rules out criticism. That if you criticise, if you're at all critical of religion, then you're not being respectful of it. Um, so, when you're talking about critical respect, do, do you th how is how is it possible both to be respectful and critical at the same time? Well, you know, uh, there is a hierarchical notion of respect, in which uh, to respect something is to defer to it and and to show deference to it, to 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 uh, to put a halo around it, to to think of it as sacred and therefore any kind of questioning is taboo and so on. Uh, and that's obviously not the notion of respect that I'm, I'm in favor of. Uh, that is certainly uh, more or less inconsistent with any idea of criticism. But there is another notion of respect, which is uh, found in uh, more egalitarian societies, where we talk about you know how we must owe what sort of uh, uh, you know we have to uh, uh, treat each other uh, as ends in themselves and not merely as a means to an end. The famous sort of uh, formulation, well, not exactly, but you know some kind of a, a, a reformulation of of Kant. Uh, I mean, the idea of dignity uh, of, of each person, treating each person as having uh, his or her own point of view, as a, a source of meaning, a source of significance, and, and uh, giving uh, proper recognition to this capacity. Uh, that's a sort of, uh, you know, uh, that's the idea of respect that I have. And I think when I say show respect to other uh, religions. I mean to show respect to uh, to assume that people who uh, partake of that religious tradition and participate in that religious process are uh, intelligent, sensitive beings who may have made mistakes and uh, at times uh, uh, devalue their own tr uh, uh, traditions, but they have also uh, put enormous effort into into the making of their worlds and to the uh, to the to the to the uh, to to constituting their traditions, and it's, so it's showing uh, uh, respect to to the to all those people, not only the, yeah, our, our contemporaries but also our predecessors uh, who have made those uh, traditions. So it's not it's not I don't want to reify it as and treat a tradition as a thing. It's a thing which is related to uh, to persons, uh, both uh, living and dead, uh, and they are owed respect. But uh, this is entirely consistent with uh, with uh, you know uh, detecting, as I you know already pointed out, detecting uh, you know where they have gone wrong, and uh, uh, I think uh, in some ways. Uh, uh, and this is this is very counterintuitive because a lot of people, as you pointed out, a lot of people think that uh, if you are uh, you know loyal to your country or loyal or, or committed to your religion, then you must defend it uh, you know no matter how bad or you know, awful it is. But that's obviously uh, a lot of uh, rubbish. Uh, I think uh, uh, people who People who love their uh, people who are who are, who are passionate and uh, uh, you know passionately uh, love uh, some ideas or things uh, are should be very sensitive to whenever these ideas are 
uh, uh, being deformed or distorted or where they go wrong. And very often they're distorted, not by others. And that is something that we recognize. But uh, this is something which is not recognized as much. It's we ourselves who are making those mistakes. These distortions are coming because of lapses on our part. And to be able to detect them and to rectify them, because we are the ones who have to rectify them. Uh, others will not do that. Others may point out what's wrong with us, but they will never undertake the whole process of uh, of uh, what what can I say reform or or change in uh, in the uh, to, or to or some you know getting back on its track, as it were. I mean, that is something that we have to undertake ourselves and we have to be sensitive to other people's uh, uh, voices and other people's opinions. Uh, we have to critically evaluate them and we have to also have the capacity to to uh, to see uh, uh, the flaws in our own in in anything that we we deeply cherish and love, uh, because that's the only way in which we can ensure that it flourishes and it and it, it it remains a living thing, and 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 that's that that's the idea that I want to capture by this notion of critical critical respect. Uh, I never lose respect simply because I'm I'm critical of something, because I can be critical precisely because I respect that thing deeply or Thanks, love sorry. that thing. Mm. One one very final brief question from from Fabio. Let me got a brief answer to this one. Um, we are, after all, a uh, philosophy uh, organization here. Fabio asks, could mandatory philosophy classes play a role in helping multi-faith cohesion? What do you think? Depends on what kind of philosophy it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think if there are a, a good sense, I mean, and certainly, I mean, uh, 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 a good, uh, 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 solid uh, teaching of ethics, uh, uh, both religious and non-religious, uh, which conveys a sense of, of, you know, right and wrong, good and bad, and so on, uh, through uh, vivid portrayals, uh, either through literature or films. Uh, I think narratives are very central here. And I follow many, you know, important ethical philosophers in this. I don't think uh, this very self-consciously dry, anti-literary, anti uh, purely analytical uh, moral philosophy uh, will, will give us uh, what we are hoping to achieve. Uh, through philosophy classes, but I think if the right kind of philosophy is taught, which, by the way, would be sensitive to to other alternative ways of grasping, you know, uh, what what some you know we might call it totality or wholeness, which is the art and religion, and it just goes back to the point that I that I made when I referred to Merlin, Don Merlin Donald, the evolutionary psychologist, who talked about the importance in human life of three ways of thinking or three ways of, of uh, cognitive representations, the, the mimetic, the mythic, and the theoretic. I think there's, you know, some philosophy is excessively sort of theoretic. Uh, it's very self-consciously um, uh, abstract and, you know, abstractly theoretical. I think uh, that's not the sort of philosophy that you need when you're, you know, trying to uh, resolve ethical issues uh, in society or in politics uh, or even at an interpersonal level. I think you 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 need to draw upon the resources of the mythic and the and the mimetic as well, uh, not just uh, you know scientific theorizing. And I think some some philosophy has depended too much on the model of. Uh, of scientific theorizing and uh, Aristotelian logic, and I think that's uh, that's good and useful for certain purposes. But in sorting out, you know, life and death issues, and sorting out our social and political problems, uh, you need a much more uh, nuanced sense of contextual reasoning, 
and of uh, a sense, uh, you know, a sensitivity to the multiple goods uh, that there are uh, and how we deal with them, how we negotiate, how we uh, wade through them. And, and, uh, and this is something that philosophy can teach. And I think such philosophy would be welcome, a, a philosophy that is sensitive to the mythic and the, and the mimetic, but which also teaches critical reasoning. Yeah, absolutely. I think it will play a very important role and should play an important role in uh, higher, higher, you know, in, in, in high schools uh, and should be mandatory, I think, should be. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Rajiv. Um, before we go, just um, some upcoming, we've got some more talks coming up in the series. I should have some information on those coming up on the screen. And next on 5th of March, Diana Coyle, Reclaiming the Online World for the Public Realm. Um, after that, I think we have Heisuk Kim on individual freedom in the post-pandemic era. We might have a couple more of these things. Yep, Say, Sailor Ben Habib, can we still defend the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees? A lot of people obviously have been uh, suggesting that we can't. It'd be very interesting to see what she has to say. And I think one more maybe, yes, finally in the series, Deborah Satz, who's going to argue for a requirement for national public service all these talks um you can watch live as they happen or you can watch them afterwards on our youtube channel where there is now a growing library of talks from previous series as well as our annual uh annual lectures and and debates so please do check out that channel follow us perhaps on youtube as well well i mean on facebook as well sorry where you can also hear about upcoming events but thank you for listening and watching this evening and thank you very much Rajiv Bhaga for a fascinating talk and a, a really great discussion which could have gone on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Julian. Bye-bye.